This is Space Time Series 25, Episode 28, for broadcast on the 7th of March, 2022. Coming up on Space Time, how Russia's war against Ukraine is changing space operations, discovery of a killer nova, and Rocket Lab's new second launch pad opens for business. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Mission managers are looking at new ways to keep the International Space Station flying as sanctions following the Russian invasion of Ukraine split space operations around the world and beyond. NASA and the European Space Agency are exploring new ways to keep the orbiting outposts flying without help from Roscosmos. The International Space Station is a joint multinational operation with separate Russian and American sections. However, it's a lot more complicated than that. You see, some of the Russian modules were actually funded by the United States. The idea was to keep former Soviet Union scientists employed and prevent them from working for Iraq and Iran on nuclear weapons programs. And the space station's operations aren't located in just one module. They're distributed around the orbiting outpost, with the American side being responsible for power and life support, while the Russian section houses the orbiting outpost propulsion and navigation systems. Part of this role includes using docked Progress cargo ships to periodically give the space station a boost in altitude in order to maintain a 400 km high orbit and to maneuver it out of the way of passing space junk, which is becoming a growing problem, especially following recent Russian and Chinese anti-satellite missile tests. At the moment, four American, two Russians and a German are currently on station, and operations are continuing normally, with flight control teams still communicating, training and working together. But some joint scientific research programs on the station have been stopped. More long term, the Americans want to keep the International Space Station flying until at least 2030. But the Russian-built sections of the orbiting outpost are already reaching the end of their useful life. And Moscow says Russia will leave in the next few years, once its own space station, which is now under construction, is placed into orbit. Whether they'll take all of their section of the space station, or just their newer modules, is yet to be determined. But if things keep going the way they currently are, we may not need to wait for very long. Roscosmos Director General Dmitry Rogozin has raised the prospect of pulling out of the partnership altogether in response to the Western sanctions. Northrop Grumman says its Cygnus cargo ships could be used to replace progress in order to boost the space station as needed. Meanwhile, SpaceX boss Elon Musk tweeted his company's logo in response to Rogozin's rhetorical question about who would save the space station from an uncontrolled deorbit. ACE has already issued formal statements indicating that it's proceeding with implementing sanctions imposed on Russia by the European Union's member states. Meanwhile, Russia's now suspended all Soyuz launches from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana, and it's recalled all Roscosmos staff based there. There are currently 87 Russian personnel working at the facility. The Soyuz began flying from Kourou in 2011, replacing the Ariane 4 as Ariane Space's medium lift launch vehicle. The next Soyuz launch from Kourou was slated for April the 6th. ACE is now rescheduling Soyuz payloads onto additional Ariane 6 and Vega C flights instead. And Russia's response to Western sanctions doesn't end there. Rogozin's halted delivery of Russian built RD 180 rocket engines to the United States. Since the mid-1990s, 122 RD-180 rocket engines have been ordered from Russia by the United States for use on Atlas V rockets. So far, 98 of them have been used, with a further 24 sitting in warehouses in the United States waiting to be installed. However, Russia says it'll no longer supply any of these engines, nor will it maintain and service the remaining stored engines which are yet to be used. Also under a cloud is the joint ESA-ROS-COSMOS-EXO-MARS mission, which was to launch in September. 
The European Space Agency says the mission, which had already been delayed two years by the COVID pandemic, as well as technical problems, is now very unlikely to fly due to the sanctions. The mission, which includes the European-built Rosalind Franklin Mars rover, was to fly on a Russian proton rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan. Postponing the launch again would mean another two-year delay before the next favourable Earth-Mars orbital alignment, that's assuming it ever flies at all. Also put on the back burner was last Friday's slated launch of the Soyuz from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, carrying another 36 one-way broadband internet satellites. Moscow demanded the satellites not be used for military purposes and that the British government withdraws from OneWeb. Images showed American, Japanese and British flags being removed from the Soyuz payload fairing. Rogozin captured the images, saying the Soyuz looks much better without them. Meanwhile, the British government's issued its own statement, saying it may no longer make any sense to launch on Russian rockets. Moscow's also turned off one of the science instruments aboard the joint Russian-German Spectre RG high-energy space telescope, destroying years of scientific research. Launched in July 2019, Spectre RG is located 1.5 million kilometres from Earth at the Lagrange L2 position on the opposite side of the Earth to the Sun. Spectre RG's instruments include the German Arosa X-ray Space Telescope built by the Max Planck Institute and the Russian-built ART-XC High Energy X-ray Telescope, which is designed to detect supermassive black holes. And finally, as well as the incredible loss of life, one of the many casualties of Russia's war against Ukraine has been the destruction of the world's largest aircraft. The famous Antonov AN-225 Maria or Dream has been destroyed by Russian forces while in a hangout near Kiev. The massive six-engine behemoth was built in Ukraine by the former Soviet Union to transport the Russian Buran space shuttle. With a wingspan of 88 metres and some 84 metres in length, the AN-225 could carry more than 250 tons and reach speeds of 850 kilometres per hour. And with just the flash of a bomb, the world's largest aircraft is no more. During the past week, Russian President Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine became dramatically worse, if that's possible, when he suddenly ordered Moscow's nuclear forces to be put on high alert. Unlike the Americans, Russian conflict doctrine includes a strategy of using tactical nuclear weapons to change the balance of power in battlefield conditions. The move, described as dangerous and irresponsible by NATO officials, came as Russian troops and tanks drove deeper into Ukraine against strong resistance. And the thing is, Russia already has the tactical nuclear delivery systems in Ukraine ready for use. These include the 2S7 Pion and 9K720 Iskander. Pion is a 203mm self-propelled heavy artillery gun. In fact, it's the heaviest artillery piece in the world. It's capable of delivering a 110 kilogram conventional shell or a 1 kiloton thermonuclear munition over a range of 37.5 kilometres. The 9K720 Iskander, which also goes by the NATO codename SS26 Stone, is a mobile short range ballistic missile system capable of launching a variety of missiles equipped with conventional or thermonuclear warheads over a range of 500 kilometres. But Putin doesn't need the nuclear option to utilise weapons of mass destruction. Among the equipment involved in Russia's invasion of Ukraine were the latest TOS-1 rocket launchers, which are capable of firing thermobaric weapons. Thermobaric weapons, so-called vacuum bombs, contain a type of explosive that uses oxygen from the surrounding air in order to generate high-temperature explosions with a long-duration blast wave that can take out an entire city block with a wall of fire, killing everyone and everything in its path. A weapon of mass destruction without needing to go nuclear. This is Space Time. Still to come, discovery of a killer nova. And Rocket Lab's new second launch pad opens for business. All that and more still to come on Space Time. (music) 
astronomers may have detected a sonic boom from a powerful blast known as a kilonova. The event, known as GW170817, was a merger of two neutron stars, and it was the first object detected in both gravitational waves and in electromagnetic radiation or light. A kilonova occurs when two neutron stars merge. Neutron stars are stellar corpses created out of the core collapse supernova explosions of stars far more massive than the Sun. This event on August 17, 2017, was first detected as a strange gravitational wave signal by the LIGO and Virgo gravitational wave observatories, coinciding with a gamma ray burst. Since then, astronomers have been using telescopes across the electromagnetic spectrum, including NASA's Chandra X-ray Space Observatory, to study the evolution of this event. And now, almost five years later, Chandra is the only observatory still able to detect light from this extraordinary cosmic collision. Astronomers say the observations are entering uncharted territory in the ability to study the aftermath of a neutron star merger. As the two neutron stars merged, the debris generated visible and infrared light from the decay of radioactive elements like platinum and gold formed in the debris from the merger. This burst of light is called a kilonova. Indeed, visible light and infrared emissions were detected from GW170817 several hours after the gravitational waves. But the neutron star merger looked very different in X-rays. Right after the initial LIGO detection was announced, scientists requested that Chandra quickly pivot from its current target to GW170817. Now, at first, they didn't see any X-rays coming from the source at all. But when they checked it out again on the 26th of August 2017, Chandra found an X-ray point source. The initial non-detection of X-rays, followed by a detection later, provides evidence for a narrow jet of high-energy particles produced by the neutron star merger. The jet was off-axis, that is, not pointing directly at the Earth. Consequently, we couldn't see it. Researchers think Chandra originally viewed the narrow jet from its side and therefore saw no X-rays immediately after the gravitational waves were detected. However, as time passed and material in the jet slowed down and widened, it slammed into the surrounding interstellar material. And this caused the cone of the jet to begin to expand more into Chandra's direct line of sight. An X-ray emission was then detected. Since early 2018, the X-ray emission caused by the jet has steadily been getting fainter as the jet further slows down and expands. The authors noticed that from March 2020 until the end of the year, the decline stopped and the X-ray emission retained a constant brightness. The fact that the X-ray suddenly stopped fading quickly was evidence of something else other than the jets were being detected in X-rays at the source. A completely different origin of X-rays appear to be needed to explain what's being observed. A report in the Astrophysical Journal Letters claims the leading explanation for this new source of X-rays is that the expanding debris from the merger has generated a shockwave, sort of like a sonic boom. The emission produced by the material heated by the shock front is called a kilonova afterglow. An alternative explanation is that the X-rays are coming from material falling towards the black hole, which formed after the neutron stars merged. One of the study's authors, Joe Bright from the University of California, Berkeley, says this will be either the first time astronomers have seen a kilonova afterglow, or the first time astronomers have seen material falling onto the accretion disk of a black hole immediately following a neutron star merger. Either outcome would be extremely exciting. To try and work out which explanation turns out to be correct, astronomers will need to keep monitoring this merger in both X-rays and radio waves. If it's a kilonova afterglow, the radio emissions are expected to get brighter over time and be again detected in the next few months or years. On the other hand, if the explanation involves matter falling onto the accretion disk of a black hole, then the X-ray output should either stay steady or decline rapidly, and no radio emission will be detected over time. The detection of a kilonova afterglow would imply that the merger did not immediately produce the black hole. Alternatively, the object may offer astronomers a chance to study how matter falls into a black hole during the first few years after its birth. This report from NASA TV. On August 8, 2017, scientists using gravitational wave detectors in the United States and Europe 
picked up a new signal. This object, which became known as GW170817, became the first time that gravitational waves and electromagnetic radiation, or light, were seen from the same source. Astronomers soon classified the burst of light as a kilonova, resulting from the merger of some of the densest objects in the universe. There were many telescopes that observed light from GW170817 in the hours and days immediately after the gravitational waves were detected. Most of those signals have faded away. NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory is the only observatory still able to detect light from this extraordinary cosmic collision more than four years after the original event. What have astronomers seen in the Chandra data? Right after the initial LIGO detection was announced, scientists requested that Chandra quickly pivot from its current target to GW170817. At first, they did not see any X-rays from this source, but about nine days later, Chandra looked again and found a point source of X-rays. This non-detection of X-rays quickly followed by a detection provides evidence for a narrow jet of high energy particles produced by the neutron star merger. The jet is off axis, that is, not pointing directly toward Earth. Researchers think that Chandra originally viewed the narrow jet from its side and therefore saw no X-rays immediately after the gravitational waves were detected. However, as time passed, the material in the jet slowed down and widened as it slammed into surrounding material. This caused the cone of the jet to begin to expand more into Chandra's direct line of sight. An X-ray emission was detected. Since early 2018, the X-ray emission caused by the jet had steadily been getting fainter as the jet further slowed down and expanded. Researchers then noticed that from March 2020 until the end of 2020, the decline stopped and the X-ray emission was approximately constant in brightness. The fact that the X-rays stopped fading quickly was the best evidence yet that something, in addition to a jet, is being detected in X-rays in this source. In fact, the scientists had to identify a completely different source of X-rays to explain what they were seeing. A leading explanation for this new source of X-rays is that the expanding debris from the merger has generated a shock, like the sonic boom from a supersonic plane. The emission produced by material heated by the shock is called a kilonova afterglow. An alternative explanation is that the X-rays come from material falling toward a black hole that formed after the neutron stars merged. To distinguish between the two explanations, astronomers will keep monitoring GW170817 in X-rays and radio waves. If it is a kilonova afterglow, the radio emission is expected to get brighter over time and be detected again in the next few months or years. If the explanation involves matter falling onto a newly formed black hole, then the X-ray output should stay steady or decline rapidly, and no radio emission will be detected over time. Astronomers will continue to monitor GW170817 with Chandra and other telescopes to see what new secrets this object may reveal. This is space time. Still to come, Rocket Lab's new second launch pad opens for business, and later in the science report, a new study shows significant changes in the brains of people who suffered from COVID-19. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Rocket Lab has successfully launched their first mission from the company's new launch pad B at their Mahaya Peninsula launch complex on New Zealand's North Island East Coast. Construction of the second launch pad at their complex began back in December 2019. The mission, named the Owl's Night Continues, marked the 24th launch of an electron rocket and the 110th successful orbital satellite insertion. 
The mission's payload was a synthetic aperture radar Earth observation satellite for the commercial operator Synspective. The team are tracking no issues with the launch vehicle. Synspective's payload remains healthy and the weather is looking clear for an on-time launch. Soon at T-2 minutes, the switch occurs from our team manually controlling the clock to having the countdown take place during an auto sequence run by the rocket itself. At T minus 1 minute and 30 seconds, we should hear the call that locks loading is finished and electrons tanks are full. And shortly after that, at T minus 1 minute, we can expect confirmation that the launch vehicle's first and second stages are pressurized for launch. Then it's on to the countdown run by the launch director from T minus 10 seconds and liftoff of the mission for Inspective. Let's go to the audio channels for mission control and listen in. All avian aux batteries have switched to internal power. Vehicle is on internal power. EFTS is green and enabled for flight. Box load is complete. System in recirculation. Anti-geysering is disabled. High flow engine purge enabled. Deluge is activated. Stage one and stage two are pressed. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, <laughs> Stage one propulsion is nominal. T plus 40 seconds into the mission and our 24th electron has lifted off from pad B at Rocket Lab Launch Complex 1. Electron powering its way to space for Synspective, but before it gets there, Electron will pass through a critical point in the mission to clear max Q. This is the moment where there is maximum aerodynamic pressure working against the vehicle, hence max Q, causing the most amount of stress the rocket will experience during its climb. Electron's nine Rutherford engines are firing well and the mission remains on its correct trajectory to space. Now we will run through three actions that will happen quickly one after the other. First, all of the Rutherford engines will throttle down before shutting off completely. That is main engine cutoff or MECO. A couple of seconds later, we'll have separation of the first and second stages followed quickly by the single Rutherford engine on Electron's second stage, lighting up and continuing the mission to Earth orbit. Stage 1 propulsion is nominal, preparing for MECO. And MECO. Stage separation successful. Stage 2 ignition. Electron has had a successful MECO, stage separation and ignition of its second stage engine. We're coming up on fairing deploy shortly as well. Electron's nose cones separate and fall away to clear the way for this inspective satellite. Fairing jettison succeeded. Electron fairing falling away as planned. The rocket's second stage is continuing nominally with its inspective payload to orbit. The vehicle is currently at an altitude of 130 kilometres and reaching speeds of more than 8,700 kilometres per hour. HVB battery discharge is nominal. We are now at T plus 3 minutes and 52 seconds into the mission, having completed stage separation and fairing deploy from Electron as well. We are coming up next to battery jettison. So that will be coming up in just a few moments. But Electron is looking good, carrying on at an altitude of 160 kilometres and more than uh, 9,800 kilometres per hour. So it looks like the mission is continuing nominally as we get ready to deploy Synspector's satellite to low Earth orbit. It's travelling at speeds of more than... Um, Ooh, 11,000 kilometers per hour and at an altitude of 185 kilometers. Stage 2 propulsion is nominal. Those familiar with our 3D printed engines will know that Rutherfords use batteries to power their pumps. But much like anything that runs on batteries, we need to swap them out when they run down their power and move to a new one to keep things moving. The process of switching out this power source mid-flight is what we call battery hot swap. Throttling down. Approaching hot swap. Battery jettison confirmed. And there they go. Thank you, Battery Packs, for your service. Electron's trajectory continues to look nominal as we hit T plus 6 minutes and 25 seconds into this mission. AFTS has saved. HVB battery discharge holding nominal. We are about a minute away now from the second engine cutoff on stage two of Electron, but the mission is carrying on nominally at T plus 8 minutes and 20 seconds, and we'll be coming up to that milestone shortly. Entered burnout detected. Seeker confirmed. Mika is in transfer orbit. The Rutherford engine on Electron Stage 2 has successfully throttled down and Stage 2 and the kick stage have cleanly separated. The kick stage will now enter what we call a coast phase. For the next 50 minutes or so, it will do its first lap around Earth in an elliptical pattern. When it reaches the apogee of this orbit or the moment it is at its highest point on this egg-shaped path, the Curie engine will fire up and put us in a circular orbit. Once there, we'll deploy Synspective's Strix Beta satellite. Payload deployment is expected to take place at 
T plus 53 minutes. Synspective is developing a constellation of 30 satellites designed to deliver imagery that can detect millimeter level changes in the Earth's surface from space, independent of weather conditions, day or night. This mission was called the Isles Night Continues because it was a follow on from Rocket Lab's first launch of a Synspective satellite several years ago. The decision to build a second launch pad at Rocket Lab's Mejia Peninsula Launch Complex 1 is designed to provide the company with additional launch capacity and higher launch frequencies. Technically, the new pad is Rocket Lab's third for the company's electron launch vehicle, and it joins the existing Pad A at Launch Complex 1 and a third launch pad located at Rocket Lab's second launch complex at NASA's Wallops Island Flight Facility on the Virginian Mid-Atlantic Coast. Pad B includes a 66-ton launch platform and a 7.6-ton strongback customized for the electron launch vehicle. As well as the other launch pad, now known as Pad A, Mahia Peninsula's Launch Complex 1 also includes Rocket Lab's private range control facilities, three satellite clean rooms, a launch vehicle assembly hangar which can process multiple electron rockets for launch at once, and administrative offices. Meanwhile, Wallops Island's now also been selected by Rocket Lab as home for the company's new Neutron rocket and production facility. The Neutron will be a much larger rocket, able to lift payloads of 5 or 6 tons. The Neutron production complex, which will include rocket production, assembly and integration facilities, will be located next to NASA's gate at Wallops Island. And a new dedicated Neutron launch pad will be located at the south end of Wallops Island. Rocket Labs targeted the first Neutron medium-class orbital rocket launch for no earlier than 2024. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. One of the biggest yet COVID-19 brain imaging studies has found significant changes in the brains of people who've suffered from the virus. The findings reported in the journal Nature compared brain scans from 785 people aged between 51 and 81 in the United Kingdom. The scans were taken before and after mostly mild COVID-19 infections and compared with 401 brain scans from people who were not infected with COVID-19. Scientists found what they describe as significant deleterious long-term effects in those who have been infected with COVID-19, including changes in parts of the brain that affect memory and smell. Researchers also found that post-infected people showed larger cognitive decline than people who had not been infected. The authors say the documented effects were still being seen even after excluding people who had been hospitalised with COVID-19, implying that even mild illness may be enough to have consequences for the brain. Over 6 million people have now been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus since it first escaped from Wuhan, China. And the World Health Organization says the true death toll is likely to be at least double that amount, with some 450 million confirmed cases globally. A new study has found that air pollution is shortening people's lives by nearly three years on average, which puts it ahead of war, malaria, HIV, AIDS and smoking as the leading cause of shortened lifespans. The findings reported in the journal Cardiovascular Research looked at the effects of air pollution on six types of disease, including lung cancer, heart disease, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The authors found that cardiovascular diseases were responsible for over 40% of the loss in life expectancy linked to air pollution. They estimate that removing fossil fuel emissions could increase average life expectancy by over a year. Scientists studying a 95-million-year-old prehistoric crocodile unearthed in outback Queensland have discovered that its last meal was a dinosaur. The fossilised crocodile was discovered under a boulder while paleontologists were hunting for dinosaur bones. The croc fossil was too fragile to be moved conventionally, so researchers with the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, ANSTO, used non-destructive neutron and synchrotron X-ray micro-CT scanning technologies to identify where the bones were located. 
As they pieced together this shattered three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle, paleontologists found some bones weren't crocodilian, but dinosaurian. The dinosaur bones, which belonged to a young ornithropod, were found inside the stomach region of the crocodile, the first time such a discovery had been made. A new study shows that just like people, dogs expect high-pitched squeaks to come from very small animals and deep booming sounds to come from much larger ones. And just like people, they're puzzled when that's not the case. Scientists presented 30 dogs of varying breeds with two objects, one big and the other small. Now, each object was linked to a speaker and the researchers could manipulate them so that the sound either matched the size of the object or it could produce the opposite to what you'd expect. The dogs were trained to touch the object after it admitted the sound. And when the object and sound didn't match up, the dogs were slower to touch the object than when they did match up. The findings reported in the Journal of the Royal Society Open Science suggest that the dogs were clearly confused when the sounds didn't match the size of the object. A new study has found that serious poltergeist investigators have a lot of experience in failing to find any real evidence of poltergeist activity. True believers say poltergeists are those troublesome ghosts that tend to move things around and knock things off shelves. A bit like cats, really. But as Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics found out, ghost hunters have an especially hard time tracking them down. Every paranormal investigator says that they treat this stuff seriously and from a scientific perspective. And they have all sorts of uh, equipment and little machines that go beep to try and prove how scientific they are. Don't um, forget the, the camouflage the fact, gear. And the camouflage gear, which is obviously very scientific. I'm still trying to figure out why ghosts only come out at night. And if you only come out at night, why do you need the camouflage gear? It's, it's a very strange sort of thing, but it's, it's an image thing, obviously. But the interesting thing is that uh, a particular article that cropped up recently supposedly looked at the scientific investigation the polka guys and saying that a lot of explanations come down pretty quickly to hoaxes or mistaken identity, making errors of judgment. I would say that's pretty true. <laughs> Virtually all the evidence I've seen, certainly photographic evidence, is I can almost say the vast majority of it is examples of hoaxing or misunderstanding of, of natural occurrences or accidental occurrences. Certainly there are things out there which are unexplained, but then making the jump to saying it's a poltergeist is a big thing. This particular article points out that unfortunately for, for the poor old paranormal investigators, they often get there too late, that the event or the, um, the haunting might only take a, a day or so, and by the time they hear of it, they haven't, um, it's all over. Yeah, but um, poltergeist is supposed to haunt the one area for a while. They're more sedentary, aren't they, than other ghosts? They like hanging around and throwing things off shelves. The interesting thing is poltergeists often hang around places where they weren't there in the first place. There's a case of a particular dormitory in some building is haunted by ghosts who didn't die there. They died somewhere else in the hospital. And you think, well, why did they make the jump? I mean, surely they should be haunting the hospital. The sense of logic in a lot of this stuff is very drawn out. I would suggest that most paranormal investigators are serious people. I think there might be an element of fun in it, and certainly there are people who take customers on ghost tours and that sort of thing. But I can't see any reason why most paranormal investigators with their little machines that go bip are actually themselves necessarily faking. There are those who might make a living of it, and there are some that I've seen who put videos out basically once a week talking about all the ghosts they've discovered. And that strikes me as a bit too much, really, for what uh, you might be expecting ghost sightings to be, as this particular article says serious poltergeist investigators have a lot of experience failing to find poltergeist activity and yet you get the occasional ones who seem inordinately lucky at filming something falling off a shelf and that sort of thing and you think "Uh uh-huh right that might be a hoax there are others that that might be misunderstanding and therefore yeah bad evidence on top of bad evidence does not make good evidence and that's basically what we're looking at here the evidence that's put forward in the things that i've looked at are either easily explained or just very very poor and you know sometimes the photos of ghosts that you look at you think i can't see what they're seeing (laughs) The, the one I always remember is the very famous Australian hoax where the TV cameras were there for 60 minutes or current affair or whoever. They were there and all of a sudden the vase on the book stand falls down all by itself. And yep. that was quite shocking until you realised that what they had done beforehand, they had turned the ceiling fan on. And there was a little nut that I had strategically placed on the fan blade. So once the fan built up enough revs, the nut flew off through centrifugal force, hit the vase, and then the vase fell down. That's how they did it. It was a hoax. Where it hit doesn't matter. The fact is something would have happened. There would have been a bang somewhere or a noise somewhere. They really couldn't have asked for anything better than the porcelain vase smashing, but 
whatever. Yeah, no, it's that's, still that's, cool. It's impressive. Most of the things you see, you look at, especially with videos and that sort of stuff, you can either, you very clearly see how it's been manipulated, sometimes just by a piece of string, quite frankly. I mean, you can wipe out a, a piece of string with modern software and, you know, on a video. These things, they drag it out. Yeah, that, that's Ockham's razor. Simplest explanation is the easiest. Articles like this one on poltergeist activity and trying to work it into a scientific perspective just draw up things like unknown physics. And you think, well, that's not um, valid at all to say uh, the reason this happens is because of energies unknown to science. Well, they're unknown and they, you can't quote them then. That, uh, maybe there are other reasons, simpler reasons why some of these phenomena are happening. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 